Jim Geezer, Jim here on YouTube as well. We are running forward with, we're continuing our module review that I kind of started yesterday. Um, kind of was inspired by the fifth edition announcements and some of my play group. Well, basically we're, we're looking at a round two of Vecna, the Vecna. Oh my gosh, my sound is spiking super high, sorry. Um, Vecna, who is Vecna? What is Vecna? All of that kind of fun stuff. If I, uh, you know, kind of said on my same, sh my previous stream, is, it's the same point. If you know of Vecna and you think he's the super big, bad, most evil guy that D&D has ever seen, then, then you're a modern Dungeons & Dragons player. Learned about him through Critical Role. You learned about him through Stranger Things. You've learned about him through uh, Hasbro's D&D releases. That's cool. No big deal. If you're um, like, oh, that's the dude that, couldn't keep his eye in his head and his hand on his arm and got his ass kicked repeatedly through the old school, then you're someone like me. You're like, this guy's a joke. Uh, how the hell did he get into this super big badass guy? And if you're just familiar with three or four lines of text in third edition that says that he became a demigod and lesser power at that point, then you're a third edition guy. And, and there wasn't a whole lot of stock and time put into lore at that point. It was more rules and content. So, yeah. Depending on... Um, where you are in things, depending on your timeline, as it were, you might have a different opinion on Vecna. And I'm not here to try to change opinions, well, maybe a little bit, but I am here to uh, kind of go through the literary history of Vecna, if you will. Where did he come from? Uh, and the best way to do that is to explore some of the original publications that he showed up in. So yeah, that's what we're going to uh, continue on today. Let's flip my other one bigger picture of me. So if you watched my stream yesterday or if you've caught my uh, YouTube video, uh, we reviewed the module WGA4 Vecna Lives, kind of went into some depths. I apologize. There's a little bit of background noise. As I'm trying to get this stream going. Um, I was a little bit late to start, but we got to get going. So um, hold on. I'm going to mute, guys. If you're following, I know I've got one viewer. I'm so sorry. My background noise is horrible right now. Uh, I'm going to mute and we'll be right back in just a minute. I'm sorry. All right, my apologies. Uh, my noise situation is better. My wife, who works hard, is, is while I sit here and twitch all day, is getting on her day. So let her finish up. Love you, babe. Um, so anyway. Oh, yeah, there was a brief. Uh, yeah, so Vecna Lives is what we covered yesterday. This was actually the first true adventure, true lore collection for Vecna. And this was published in 90... Where are we looking at? I think it was 1990. Second edition AD&D, Greyhawk Adventures, Vecna Lives by Dave Cook. Full module review on yesterday's episode on my YouTube channel. Don't want to spend a whole lot of time in it. Um, but yeah, just as a brief overview, this module sucks as an adventure. It's a great source. It's a great source of information. It's a great source of lore if you're a Vecna fan, just to find the history and the, the OG, if you will. Not a good adventure. Very, very MacGuffin-ish very poorly structured, huge sections of travel that aren't really fleshed out, expectations that the group spends some time in the city of Greyhawk um, with no map provided, with no content provided. Basically, this was if you needed something to do and you had all the other content, that's kind of where this module filled in. Again, not a good adventure, wonderful source material. Learn about Vecna as the, ori as the original, uh, the designers as the original authors wanted him to be represented. Again, according to the Vecna Lives book, the lore for Vecna was simply filled in because they had a hand of Vecna and an eye of Vecna laying around for like 15 years with nothing attached to it and the sort of costs. There was a little bit of internal mention of, the, of, of their little battles and all that, but this kind of codified what we understand in 5th edition as far as the hand, the eye of Vecna, the sort of costs and their rivalry, okay? Vecna fans, pick this up, get some lore. Don't really care about Vecna, don't waste your time, not a great module. 
But continuing on, we're going to flip on over to uh, Vecna Reborn. Vecna Reborn is the second of the trilogy. Um, real quick, I'm actually going to dig around and find the third one just so we have all three up so you can follow what I'm saying. I've got, I don't know, 18 gigs of, of classic, legally purchased classic PDFs. Um, I die, Vecna, die. Rest of the so um, just kind of touch base on things again real quick. I know we're, 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 we're working backwards is the assumption you haven't actually been, uh, I don't want to leave you in blanks and have to make you go watch other episodes. I kind of do, but I still want to give a full picture. The Vecna trilogy is not an actual trilogy that a group would play together. Like you would f see Giants 1, 2, 3 against the Steading of the Hill Giants, uh, the Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant to the Halls of the Fire Giant. That was a three-module series that your players started in G1, ended in G3. Uh, A1 through 4, the Scourge of the Slave Lords, same thing. They were campaign designs. The whole point was your, your, your party would play through a series of modules to tell the story, kind of like what we're used to in 5th edition with your campaign books. Uh, Tyranny of Dragon, Baldur's Gate, Descent into Avernus, um, etc., etc. Those are, uh, you know, campaigns. So... This is not a campaign trilogy, despite the fact that they are somewhat connected story-wise and lore-wise, the sheer structure is not uh, playable for a group. A play group cannot play together with the same characters through the three modules. They don't work that way. Whether you want to call that bad writing in the old days or whether you, for whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. Um, so the first one was Vecna Lives, which kind of brought Vecna to life in the in in the D and D universe. It, it took his items, gave them to a person. Person becomes Vecna. Party supposed to go try to stop this. Odds are they'll succeed, um, and that's actually what pushes the second module along. The second module is called Vecna Reborn, and while we're talking about the three, the third one is Die Vecna Die. The first module of the trilogy came out in ninety nineteen ninety. The second one. Took all the way till 98, Vecna Reborn, for um, your, your old uh, Ravenloft setting, what we call the Domains of Dread now. Same thing back then, now. It was, it was the Realms of Terror in the day. And uh, you might be seeing all the little tabs up here. I'll be kind of touching on those as we explore the, uh, the second um, module. So Vecna Reborn, Ravenloft, stands on its own. And I'm going to say it's an interesting, really cool module, but it's not a great Vecna thing. Um, it's, it's unique. Uh, Monty Cook did a really good job of, of putting a, a unique spin on a Vecna-based adventure for low to mid-level characters. That's the key. Your dudes are 5th to 7th level when they're doing this, so we'll, we'll get into that. And the third and the final one is Die, Vecna, Die. Um, this one was, what, 2000? Really nice and hard on my... Uh, yeah, 2000. So Vecna was born in 1990, even though his items had been around since 79 or 80. Um, he was a man without an eye and a man without a hand for uh, 11 years before they gave him an actual body and a character. And it was another uh, 10 years, 8 years, before they added him into Ravenloft. And then it was another couple years after that before they codified him as a big bad. Uh, still, even as a big bad, he was a failure. He ends up losing, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, how he is now the be-all, end-all, Tito Di Caputiti, or whatever, you, the, the big, super badass boss of all d d It's marketing. It's merchandising. Um, ain't no one else got a little hand that everyone can put in a jar on their shelf. Ain't no one else got a little eye that they can hold in their hand. It's, it's, it's toys, man. And it's pop culture, and it's smart. Vecna is a name that's re recognized through by a bunch of people that don't even really know about D&D &D because they, you know, watch the Stranger Things uh, TV show. Same thing, uh, a lot of people that got pulled into D&D &D from the critical role. Vecna was the big bad in Matt Mercer's campaign. Um, so it's like the modern itinerations of Vecna have, t have now taken over and Wizards, and fifth, uh, Wizards of the Coast 5th edition are codifying the new big bad Vecna as what it is. And that's cool. I guess, you know, uh, he'll always be a joke to me as an old guy, but that's just me personally. So enough about my ranting about the history of the Vecna modules. Let's take a look at the second module in the series, Vecna Reborn. 
Uh, the first thing you might notice as you look at the cover art is this this cool, fancy Ravenloft logo. What is Ravenloft? Okay, a lot of you guys are, are familiar with um, Ravenloft in relation to the Curse of Strahd, in relation to Barovia. Some of you might be um, more familiar with it as an actual Domain of Dread. If you're just a 5th edition person, you, you're new to the um, new to the hobby, you might have been ex exposed. Obviously, everyone kind of knows the Curse of Strahd. It's, it's kind of a flagship campaign book. It's, it's the, the whole realms, domains of terror, domains of dread, the whole kind of thing there. I don't think there's a lot of people that understand what goes into playing in the domains until they start doing it. Uh, I want to say last year or the year before, they re released Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. I think I have that. Yeah, my, my digital copy here. Uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft is the modern itineration of what of of the old Ravenloft domains of dread. Okay, so I don't want to get too far into into the domains. That could be its own ten mod, uh, ten episode chit chat series. And I mean, if if I ever get some feedback from people, they want to see that kind of thing. Let me know. I'd be happy to 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 kind of do an old school dig up all the all the books, dig up all the documents, go through it line by line. Not line by line, but just chronologically to make things make sense, you know? Does all of this matter in your home campaigns? Absolutely freaking not. If you don't care about the lore, if you don't care about the history, if you don't care about the structure, you just want to use some cool guys and some cool books, man, that's what D&D is all about. If you're a world builder and you kind of work on a logical sense and, and you want your your living worlds to be engaging and believable and steeped in a lot of lore, then that's where all of these books kind of come in and actually uh, will, will make a good, uh, will, will help you out. So, Vecna Reborn, written by Monty Cook. Love Monty Cook's work. He's also the main creator of the Planescape setting. I think that's probably my second favorite. Um, I default to Greyhawk, O-Earth, just because that's what I grew up with. That's what I know the most. Uh, I enjoyed the Forgotten Realms till they tore it back apart. Love Planescape, love Planescape, so um, quick drops there. So this is set in Ravenloft, Vecna Reborn. Basically, it picks, picks up kind of thematically at the ending of the, uh, Vecna Lives. At the end of that, whatever's happened, Vecna is, has been banished from the world, has been banished from o Earth at that point, and everyone thinks he's gone and dead, and everyone's all, yay, we saved it. What actually ends up happening is Vecna gets kicked over to the Domains of Dread, a section of the realms opens up, and it's called the Burning Peaks. If you know anything about the Domains of Dread, they're basically a demi-plane. They, they exist outside of your normal, functional, uh, prime material planes, outer planes, inner planes. They're just another bad place, literally the bad place. You're so evil and you're so rotten and you're so wicked that you don't even get to go to hell. You don't get to go to the abyss. You don't get to go to, to um, Gehenna or Carceri or any of those. You get to exist in your permanent, in your state of evil and rotten and torture forever. And the Domains of Dread take you and the realm of influence that you have, build a little pocket of, of evil that you brought in with you around it, and the theory goes that you get to exist there tortured by your fail, failings, tempted by your um, desires, and doomed forever to repeat your mistakes for, for all of eternity. And so that's what they are. They're your own special kind of hell, as it was. So our module starts out nice and early and tells us that both Koss, the, the, the uh, possessor of the Sword of Koss, and Vecna have been moved to... Uh, the bur uh, excuse me, to the Domains of Dread. Vecna was done as a punishment, as it were, and Koss was brought in as part of his punishment. Uh, Vecna is, even in this writing, in the writing of this, of this particular module, he's a, he's a pretty potent guy. Um, there's some, some text early on in the book that kind of gives you a little bit of, of background on Vecna in Ravenloft. A serpent, the ancient serpent. Uh, there are some lores in the, some some sources of lore in the second edition that actually tie 
the great serpent to being one of the two progenitors of the universe, the two lawful, lawful evil, lawful good serpents that created, that fought chaos to create the extra plane or one of the serpents falls and becomes Asmodeus. Some biblical, some biblical uh, analogy, some biblical parallels there. Uh, mileage may vary on what you want to do with that. So this module is setting up Vecna to be directly in contact with the Great Serpent, which the second edition timeline set up to be Asmodeus, a.k.a. one of the two greats. So at this point, Vecna's got some power, or at least he thinks he's got some power. He's got a, a, a guideline, a, a, a radio line directly to the greatest source of, of magic and evil in the universe. Now, what he doesn't understand is that's all a ploy. It's been made to kind of trap him. Long story short, uh, Vecna finds out a way when he realizes that he is trapped in his side of the burning, uh, the burning peaks. He can't leave. He can't do nothing. But he's such a powerful entity, supposedly, that he has figured out a way to break the curse of Ravenloft, providing he can be reborn as a physical demigod. So that's the plot of this, of this entire adventure. Um, Vecna's trying to be reborn as a demigod, get it into a physical form, allowing him to leave his realm, uh, his domain of dread, beat up on costs, and continue forward like a normal person. Uh, the party is responsible for stopping that. Now, number one, let's remember, this module was written for three to six characters of level five to seven. Okay? Three to six characters of level five to seven. So you're looking at 20-ish levels. If you took six, 20 to 40 combined character levels, it's, it's a low to, it's a, an intermediate level, mid-level adventure, which means right off the bat, you're like, you're looking at that going, wait a minute. So no, the party is not fighting Vecna. A party is not fighting Koss. The party is not even dealing directly with Vecna or Koss actually in any of this. The party is just kind of stuck in the domains of dread, trying to make be the best they can out of a bad situation. So that's the first shift. Uh, you have a module called Vecna Lives. You have all of this lore about Vecna and Koss, and the party will never encounter them. They're not supposed to. The level of the module puts them way below it. They're, they're crumbs on the plate. You know, the big guys are up here fighting and having their big dinner. Your party's just scrambling around picking up the crumbs. That's all this module's supposed to be. So first and foremost, you get all excited about it. You start reading it. You're like, oh, you went out and bought everything that said Vecna. And you realize now you're into the second module that your party don't even mess with Vecna. What the hell? <laughs> kind of cheesy. Kind of cheesy. But that's not the fault of the writer or the module. The story is really good. How you play through the module is very good. The fact that it's not interacting in, in any direct way with the namesake Vecna, not so much. And here's another thing um, that's kind of a different expectation from uh, classic play versus modern play. In a 5th edition campaign, odds are most of your people are going to know what they're going to play. You've talked about it. You've decided we're going to play Ghost of Salt Marsh or we're going to go into the Out of the Abyss. Let's play Out of the Abyss. Let's start out naked and afraid. Okay, I'm going to make a Dark Elf so I can see in the dark. I'm going to make a Warforge so I don't have to eat or drink. Okay, you know. Point being, 5th um, edition players are so expose or have such a high level of exposure to the media to the content that's available most of the time they know what they're about to play they know what they're supposed to fighting they know four five six stages of the adventure they know what character to make to make the adventure easier they know what characters builds to do to make a better job of it they you know metagaming is part and parcel for fifth edition it just is i mean there's no point in arguing about it it's just Go to an older edition or just lean back and accept it. I'm a 5th edition dungeon master, so I've kind of leaned back and accepted it. When this was published, the concept was actually that the party doesn't even know what they're about to play. Um, to keep players there knowing in Vecna's domain too early, do not tell them the name of the adventure or let them see the cover of this product. This will make the discovery all the more shocking. And, you know, in some of the other, uh, some other streams, it's I literally kind of described the old days. We'd go to the mall... B. Dalton Bookstore, Walden Book, whatever. They'd have all the modules in their little shrink wrap, and you got to see the cover and the back. It was like the inside, the, the back jacket of a book, the front cover. That's what you had to really decide your modules on, unless you waited a couple months to read the reviews in Dragon Magazine, which was also owned by TSR, so you didn't really get an honest review. There was no internet. There was no rating system for shit. It was all word of mouth. So, you know, we bought a lot of stinkers back in the day, along with a lot of hidden gems. So this was one that you initially bought 
you weren't going to tell your party what you're going to run. You're setting, setting them up to go into the Domains of Dread under the premise of whatever. You may not even be setting them up to go to Domains of Dread. They may just have the mists roll in on their campsite one night, and then they wake up in the Domains, you know, which is kind of almost the standard. So we've got them, in, got them into the Domains. Um, their first thing they're going to be in is the city of Torgorok. And uh, basically, this is where Koss hangs out. Kind of a creepy, militarized city. No one's, you know, everyone's barely got enough uh, to eat, barely enough to survive. If you're not in the army, if you're not in the military, then you're working in support of the military. So their first stop is here just to get a feel for, um, for the, this gives the DM the chance to give the party a, a, a feel for the, for the domains of dread. Start inducing that terror. Start inducing that that mor that 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 dread, that uh, negative morale, that that demoralizing kind of thing going on. Um, now, I'm gonna tell you straight up: this module is probably eighty percent to ninety percent dialogue. That is, that's not to say that there's not a lot of combat in it. There really isn't. There's a lot of opportunities for you to add combat encounters. Um, it's a very dialogue-heavy campaign. Your party is trying to figure out what's going on. Figure, first, figure out where they are. Second, figure out why they're there. Th third, figure out what the hell to do. Now, the funny thing about old Dungeons & Dragons is language was a big issue. Um, most of your stuff had common. That kind of came with Forgotten Realms. It was actually with Classic as well. You got into, or Beck me, excuse me, I say classic. Beck me, common, and, and your racial language was mostly it. AD&D actually got to the point where certain worlds had multiple languages, so there wasn't even a common in some places. Um, for example, Greyhawk, you had Oerdian, you had Flanius, you had Siluese, you had Backlinish, and you had um, old versions of each of those languages, and you weren't guaranteed to have everyone. And then you had all of your racials, Elven... Dwarvish, Halfling, da 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 So, I mean, the original setting of Greyhawk, you could literally be going across a border and unable to speak to people outside of, of trade houses or finding a translator or something like that. That carries through into this uh, this adventure as well. Uh, the DM is really kind of, uh, of told to remind the players that they don't even speak the language of a lot of the people in this town, that they're going to stick out like sore thumbs. So they're forced into... into finding one or two people that can help them navigate the city. So you're given, as a dungeon master, you're given a couple tools early to, to help ease the party into the situation. They'll, they'll be found by La Rosa Barbo or Lord Ward, Lord Ward Banquo. Uh, hey, man, uh, Hugo, thanks for, for jumping into my stream. I appreciate the, the, the chat. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to do this. I've got several older module series on my YouTube channel. It's also under DM Geezer Jim. Just kind of take apart some of the old classics and... and Talk about them. How do they? How were they then? How do they translate to now? So I'm glad to have you along. I appreciate you being here. But yeah, we're just tearing apart Vecna Reborn right now, uh, taking a look at the actual module, the art, and a lot of the stuff in it, discussing how does it work and not. So um, the module itself gives you some tools to kind of integrate the party into uh, the, this section of the of, of the domains of dread. Uh, Koss, as in the possessor of the sword of Koss, lives over here in Torgarok. And uh, our boy Vecna still has Citadel Cavitus. Now, the, the city Citadel Cavitus has actually been a constant since his first release. Um, it was originally placed in the Plain of Ash. It was kind of a private little sanctum that Vecna had, was given uh, in WGA4. Uh, in the Vecna Reborn module, it's actually transported as part of the uh, movement. Oh, let me zoom in a little bit more on the art for you. Uh, it's kind of it was moved into the domains of dread through the mists. It, this is where his his city is, his palaces, and all of it. Yes, it's a gigantic skull with a city built on the inside of it. It's kind of creepy. Um, I've made a couple effort, a couple attempts at mapping it with modern mapping software. I need to use more of a three D angle to really get it to pop. But point being, there's there are some good art assets available for you out there. So you've got Koss sitting in his city of Torgarok. You've got Vecna trapped in Citadel Cavitus. Neither of these guys that have been eternally bound to kill each other can get near each other because of the mists, the, the misty borders of the domains of dread. So this is where Vecna starts figuring his plan is to get out of 
his side of it by being reborn as a demigod mortal on the other side of the mist, which allows him to move around. Okay, so your people have uh, shown up, your party's shown up in Tovog. They found out that there's some sort of strange curse prophecy uh, that's starting to go on. They're really not giving a ton of information. You're not supposed to give them a lot. Honestly, when they get to Tovog, your number one thing is to make them feel very uncomfortable about the city. Get a couple pieces of information from lefties or Lord Banquo and get the hell out. Uh, yeah, you want to scare them out of, to out, of, out of that city and move them along to the, the passes in the Burning Cliffs. They'll make their way through the passes and get over to Citadel Cavitus, where Vecna lives. Then they'll start putting the puzzle together. Um, this is where, when you, if you heard me mention it earlier, this is a very, very dialogue-heavy campaign. It is. They've got to interview combat uh, battle survivors that they may or may not find as they scour some battlefields to find out the, the, the greater good. It should be uh, technically about act halfway through Act 1 before the party's actually figured out that they're in the domain of Koss and Vecna. As it was written then, mileage may vary from modern use. Again, most of our 5th edition players are very well educated, have plenty of access to, um, to information. You can, you can Google this file up. You can find a, 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 knock, a free PDF of it, download it, memorize it, and go play with your DM and, and make your life miserable, if, if you roll that kind of way. Um, well, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm a 5th edition guy, but I played a lot of Beck Me. I started back in, in, in the basic days, went through 1st, 2nd, kind of a little bit 3rd, didn't like 4th, came back for 5th. But yeah, so um, once again... A lot of dialogue in this. A lot of finding out information. They'll spend some time in the madhouse. They'll actually have to go back and they'll go from uh, Tovag over to Cavitus, find out some cool stuff. They'll actually have to penetrate the temple of Vecna in there to go into the Shadowed Library, which is which is a neat, neat little adventure thing. Find out the true secrets and then make their way back across the uh, the peaks back over to Tovog to end the to break the to break the cycle to break the 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 prophecy as it were um it's kind of neat i mean it lays you, lays it out for you right off the beginning uh the three words the words of creation the most powerful ones the creation once spoken these three words are what Vecna needs. They're not just three words or three statements, but these are the things that Vecna needs to transcend from his lich form back into a demigod physical manifestation. Um, they have to be preceded by a powerful ritual, but because Vecna is evil and corrupted, the ritual itself gets uh, twisted and corrupted. So um, the, the uh, where are we looking at? The... the words are preceded by uh they had them right here shit I'm trying to find it. my my apologies it'll it'll pop back up but yeah so he's got to first perform a ritual someone must perform a ritual with their hands covered in the blood of an outsider so they need to kill someone from not in ravenloft and that person that kills that person needs to do the first part of the ritual the second part of the ritual is um the, the ritual has to be performed over the pyres of the plague ridden. So the second part is Vecna actually triggers this nasty disease plague to rip on Torgorok so they can have the burning pyre of the bodies to trigger it. The third one is uh, the ritual must be performed by someone who has slain a king. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky in, in the module here. Um, yeah, you might, uh, Hugo, you might might take a look at this if you want you know pick it up it's it you can find these pdfs on dm's guild for two or three bucks or you can find it through your own source however it gives you some fun stuff it gives you some good options to to kind of take apart and make it your own it again i gotta stress it does not hold up well in fifth edition because a lot of the of the cool part of the module a lot of the the myst a lot of the adventure is the mystique of the adventure your party not knowing what they've gotten themselves into or where they're at or even what they're doing until they're, you know, half, a third of the way into the adventure. Wait, we're doing what? Wait, that costs? No, not that, Vecna. And so that's something that gets lost for modern gamers, I think, a lot of times, uh, unless we as playgroups and as dungeon masters are willing to invest that time into it. 
and and let your party know you're not going to know what's going on every day so that's a play style thing that's a decision game a uh, decision thing i'm not here to judge just here to inform um part of the fun of this adventure is preserving the mystery of what they are really getting involved in um, part of the the challenge in this adventure is imposing a language barrier forcing them to to keep themselves very, they don't want to stand out. You don't want to stand out like a sore thumb. If you're walking into Citadel Cavitus, 30% of the population is undead. The other 60% don't even really speak a normal language. So if you're walking around screaming about, hey, man, where the, where, I'm here to kick Vecna's ass, your, your party's dead quickly. So, you know, fifth edition players going to have to learn a little bit to get in here. Oh, heck yeah. That's awesome, dude. Um, so, yeah, this is the second in the series. From a lore chronology point of view, it is not supposed to play at level 1 for Vecna Lives, level 5 for Vecna Reborn, level 10 for Die, Vecna Die. The series is not set up that way. Um, they call it a trilogy only in name. So anyway, so we've got to sacrifice, get the blood of an, uh, of an outsider on us. Then we've got to burn the bodies of the plague ridden. And then we have to perform the ritual after killing a king in order for Vecna to be reborn in his new vessel. Now, in all of this, there's this one poor lady called Marit, M-A-R-I-T, that you meet early in the game. She's the pregnant niece of the leader of Vecna's cult. So we can see where this is starting to lead already. Eventually, the idea is once the, the, the ritual goes through, Vecna will be reborn within this woman, taking the place of her infant, and, and will walk the earth. So you've got, the, you know, you've got all of the creepiness, and then you throw in the fact that there's this poor mother and her infant that are going to turn into this monstrosity. And so you know, there's a little bit more motivation for the party, but how you present that kind of becomes a thing. So, you know, the, the thing we're talking about, again, number one, is keeping the idea of, of where the player's power base is in relation to what you're dealing with. Your players are walking in the city of Kos, trapped in the domain of Dread, a city that's built entirely for war. War of doing one thing, killing Vecna across the other side of the mountains. You have another city that's full of undead that can't be bothered with anything or anybody other than the worship of Vecna. And the only thing that Vecna is there to do is, 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 is extract himself from the domains and continue his quest to rule the, the multiverse. And you've got these little level five, level six people that are kind of stuck in the middle of it. Now, let me take a break off that here. Not a break break, but level five and level six in third ed in fifth edition is pretty potent. Now, level six character is, is a respectable threat. I mean, hell, let's, get, let's be honest. We've got level three people fighting dragons in, in the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle or Lost Minds of Phandalin. So... Power curve is a little wonky in Dungeons and Dragons. When it was written, level five is set, level five to seven is just high enough to start being able to get into real trouble, but not high enough level to survive it. So your party is on that cusp of we're not quite badasses yet. Uh, you know, we're we're better than we were. So that's part of 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 balancing this adventure is reminding your players that. Man, you guys are, are strangers in a strange land. Anything and everything here can eat you and tear you apart, and you're trapped here forever. So um, keep that in mind as, as you're playing, as you play through the module. So Act 1 is all about the transitions uh, going from Casa's Kingdom over to uh, Citadel Cavitus. Citadel Cavitus, you start dealing with Vecna. Um, the thing where it says the clutches of Vecna... Your party really doesn't ever even encounter or get captured by Vecna or anything. They go to Cavitus just to learn some secrets. Um, while they're there, your number one job as a DM is to present Cavitus as this very creepy, spooky, twisted, yet empty and ambivalent environment. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a balancing act. You're inside of a, of a gigantic skull that's been turned into a city, 30% of the population is undead. Hell, the doorman is a 40-foot-tall freaking giant skeleton. Kind of should put the party off a little bit. And add insult to injury, they'll find out once they enter uh, Citadel Cavitus, magic does not work. Period. That's something that you, the DM, is going to have to, to, to be prepared for. Whether you tell your party in advance or whether you wait till they get here, Magic does not work within Citadel Cavitus. 
Vecna, own, Vecna owns this domain just as much as this domain owns Vecna. The one thing that Vecna fears is anyone else using magic because Vecna understands he's gotten this powerful only because of magic. So he uses his power to maintain a null field within uh, Cavitus. Another th wrench to throw into your party. Um, yeah, a lot of your old modules kind of, of, I hate to use the word MacGuffin or railroady, but they were, they were kind of stick heavy. They were kind of, your players have to live with this condition. Fifth edition really, really steers away from, re, you know, removing any sort of power or removing any sort of agency from your player, whereas it was a standard uh, storytelling or a standard game mechanic back in, back in Yon Day. So um, keep that in mind. They get to Citadel Cavitus, they cannot use magic. They can't, it's not even like it's forbidden shame. Like, it won't. You go, blah, 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 and nothing happens. you in the name of, and nothing happens. Your spells do not work in Cavitus. So now you've gotten into a situation where your players are in a city full of undead, speaking a language that they can't understand, and absolutely unable to cast a spell. This is where the challenge picks up, and this is where a lot of your, your, your both from a gameplay and from a party maintenance thing, you need to keep in mind. It's going to take the right group of players to enjoy this type of adventure going into a situation absolutely neutered, unable to fight, unable to cast a spell, unable to barely even communicate, relying on nothing but their role play wits to, to make it through the adventure. Knowing that you have two big bads of, of the D&D of the &D world on either side of this, this, this cliff. Well, at this point, they weren't big bads. Now we recognize them as big bads. Back then, they're, we're still trying to figure out who the hell Koss and Vecna were. So, um, we've put them in a very bad situation where they've got to discover a couple pieces of information and make their way out of the city after they discover the information. Um, as I'm scrolling through this, you've seen, the, you see these little black boxes. These are your stat blocks, similar to what you'd see in 5th edition. Most of the time, your first second, your Beck Me through 3rd edition, well, I'm going to leave 3rd edition out. Beckney through second edition um, adventures aren't that hard to translate. A skeleton in first edition is a skeleton in fifth edition. A ankeg in second edition is pretty close to an ankeg in fifth edition. Most of the time you can just pull the block out, substitute the monster for the monster. This module is a little bit different. You have a lot of custom monsters. You're going to have to do some homebrewing or take some time to find some, some similar powered creatures if you don't want to homebrew your monsters for, for fifth edition use. Uh, if you just want to go buy the number and play it dirty and quick, and it's not super hard to do, it's not the most accurate, but you can look at a stat block right quick, and um, that's a bad one. We're going to avoid, we're going to ignore the priest because it's a, a, a dual class that changes it up a little bit for what you need to do to translate. Not really. Um, okay, we're looking at it. She's a magic user 2, priest 5, priest of Vecna, human male or human female, armor class of 10. So an armor class of 10 is an armor class of 10. <laughs> uh, 20 is your ideal armor class, idealized armor class in 5th edition. Zero is your idealized armor class in 1st edition. So to get your useful armor class, um, oh, no worries, man. Well, I'll be here. Check. Uh, appreciate you jumping in. Uh, hopefully we'll catch you back around, Hugo. I'm here. Love to have you follow me. Uh, I, I do stuff all week long. But, yeah, enjoy your lunch, and, and we're, we're running it here. We're still recording for our YouTube channel as well. So you're looking at your stat blocks. Uh, you're going to subtract that number from 20 to give yourself your, your quick armor class. A movement of 12 is equal to 30 foot of movement. Hit points of 30, self-explanatory. Your hit dice, um, magic user 2, priest 5. You can go with your priest, so they're going to be 5d8. Um, for your damage, your thaco of 18 means to hit an armor class of 0, they have to roll an 18 or better. So you're going to take that as a nice, simple plus two for their hit. Subtract Thacko from 20. That gives you a quick plus, uh, plus to hit for 5th edition translations. Uh, damage is, is almost identical. A dagger is a dagger. 1d4. There's just, you're missing proficiency bonuses, and you're missing some stat bonuses that you would normally have in a 5th edition block. Most of what you need to run 5th uh, edition games is in what in the first edition, second edition monster blocks. The vast majority of what you need is there, so it's not. 
So while we're in Cavitus, um, somehow if your party can manage to converse and and interact with the population, they'll find out there's there's this entire sub layer. You have a ghoul lord, a vampire guy, and a hag chick that are all vying for power. They all understand that Vecna's in charge. They're his lieutenants, whatever. But who you know, they're fighting each other to be who's the most favored lieutenant. So there is some possibility for some interaction there. Matter of fact, if the party takes the time to form form those relationships, it makes the transition through Cavitus a little bit easier. Um, their whole goal in Cavitus is to find out what's going on, to find out what the secrets are to make their way into the Temple of Vecna, which, you know, is not the most impressive map. Yeah, Man, the, the maps for some of the, the mid-tier edition stuff was not great. We had some of the coolest maps in the world in Beckme. We had some awesome dungeons and map designs in first edition. They started getting a little bit weak in second edition. It's like, we need a cooler map. Well, cooler just became bigger. Uh, cooler just became bigger, bigger and bigger, like this end called Chirpers. I mean, I'll talk about that when I do. But yeah, so you're looking at a one square equals 10 feet. If you run a virtual tabletop, and you actually wanted to map out this entire Temple of Vecna, you're looking at uh, 450 feet wide and... Oh, I'm sorry, 550 feet wide and 450 feet high. Huge map. Break it into sections if you need to for a virtual tabletop. Uh, Theater-minded if you're not worried about uh, anything from there. But yeah, so your Temple of Vecna, they get in there as a, the chant. Even there, there's minuscule chance for combat until they figure out what they need to do to get into the Shadow Vault. Uh, once they get into the Shadow Vault, the, the Mirror Room, um, they have to do a little bit more. There's a cool little puzzle thing that they have to figure out. It's a kind of a common sense thing. They have a broken rune stone and some mirrors. If they line up the, mir the stone in the mirror right, it completes the rune stone and allows them teleportation to the Shadow Library. Once they commit the the mirror, once they complete the mirror dance, and go to the shadowed room. They'll be able to find out the secret of what Vecna is doing, and once they find that out, with what they combined with what they learned over in Tasa's place, they now have enough to stop him. They cannot physically stop Vecna. They cannot physically interact with Kos. The sword of Kos is just in a name. They'll never even see it. They'll never even see Vecna in this adventure, y'all. It's it is what it is. We talk about him by name. But he's just the big bad guy in the shadow. You know, he's not even walking amongst the street. He's not even like Strahd, where Strahd pops in and, you know, teases the party at level two. Ha, 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 I'm Strahd, you're in my realm, and I will eat you soon. But first, I will toy with you. Ha, ha, ha. You don't get that with Vecna at all in this. He's so far above and beyond the, the, the happenings that he's, for all intent and purposes, oblivious to the existence of the party. And for the party's level and power and what's going on, for all intent and purposes, they couldn't affect anything directly with him to begin with. They can't defeat Vecna. They can't stand to him. They have to defeat his plot. So that's where this is going from there. They've gotten over to Cavitus. They've made their way into the Shadowed Room. The Shadowed Room's kind of neat. It, it does a little bit of callback to his history as a great mage back in the, the world of O-Earth, back in the Greyhawk world. Uh, when they go into the when they go into the room, it's basically a shadow of his library that existed before his original city got destroyed. Um, so you're going in here, and you just the 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 idea is the strength and the power of the magic and the evil of the guy and everything was so strong that even when the city was destroyed, a shadow of the room and its information continue to exist beyond space and time. You can't affect anything there you can't remove anything from there but you can see the shadow of everything forever so it's, it's kind of a neat concept to play with as far as as a world building as far as an encounter location goes you know i, I do tip my hat that it, it's it's a quick fun puzzle and a really fun interesting set piece to put your party into no combat nothing but just describing it so again we're, we're continuing along where this is very much a role play heavy dialogue heavy theater of the mind heavy adventure module. So once they get out of the shadow room, they got to make their way out of Cavitus and back over to Tovog. Uh, and there's the, there's the whole mountain passes between them. There's a little, you know, there's like two passes that are accepted to go through. And um, uh, let me scroll back on that. That is one really kind of cool thing that 
it's probably worth pulling out and using for your own adventures if you don't have a, a system for it. A lot of times when you're a dungeon master, you're making your party, you're expecting them to go west across the mountain range, follow the dirt road, go through the pass, pay the toll at the gate at the top of the pass, and go down there the other side. Should be smooth, should be, you know, non-incidental, half a session of dialogue as you travel, maybe a random encounter if you wanted to. What happens when your party says, ah, I don't want to go over that pass. I ain't paying no toll. Let's go over that way. Yeah, I've got a nature skill, da, da, da. So this actually gives you kind of a nice little uh, section here, the three passes section. Uh, they can give you some information, some quick ideas to keep your party on track. If they have to go over a certain place in the mountains, this helps keep them on track. Or at least gives you some quick and easy challenges to throw in your party's way that still flow with the nature of your environment. So there are... That's one good thing I love about your older modules. They do give you the tools to work within the environment that you have. You don't have to refer back, typically, you don't have to refer back to your DM's guide to find a table to say what's an, a, a rock formation hazard, what's a mountainous hazard for this area. Well, let me go look, oh, okay, Google mountainous hazard. Oh, okay, so your old modules give you do a good job of giving you those. Some of your fifth edition do as well. Some of your fifth edition give environmental hazards. Some, not all. Each to their own. So anyway, I digress. You have tools to make the trip across the mountain pass as simple or as formidable as you want to as a dungeon master and as your players will allow with their decisions. So, you know, we'll get back over to that. So they made their way back across the, the mountain pass. They're back to Tovog and they've got to stop the ritual. Problem is when they get across uh, the pass, the plague is in full swing. A th Truly, 10% of, of Tovag's population is already dead. Another 10% of it's infected. Half of the city has been kicked out the gates. If the, the military has gotten into a panic, if you're sick, if one of your friends was sick, or if they think you're sick, if you sneezed, they're kicking you out of the city. Anyone that's got a, any chance of having that plague is now living around the outskirts of Tovag. So your party is now making their way through a, a siege camp of sick people. Uh, into a armed fortress of a city that was already a military camp. All the while with the whole prophecy of, of Vecna breathing down their necks. So once again, not a lot of combat, a lot of tension, a lot of, of responsibility for you, the dungeon master, to set the scene, to set the environment, to set the mood for their players. They're not wading through and hacking and slashing and fireballing their way through these. These are refugees. These are sick people. They're grabbing on the party. Oh, please help. Give me some food. Oh, my baby, blah, blah, blah. And they're doing it in a foreign language that your party doesn't understand. And your party should be freaking out because they've got all of these sick people just grabbing on them and coughing on them and sneezing on them as they're pushing through trying to make their way through the gate. Moments like that are, are what you need to focus on as a DM just to put that that ooky factor, that that scary factor in. When you're playing in, in Domains of Dread, when you're playing in, in, in that area, it's just you've got to find the little things. Anything that would make your player uncomfortable as a person, um, within reasons, I'm not talking like, you know, you avoid trigger stuff, but getting sneezed on, that's a reaction thing by everybody. You know, oh man, and so you, you lose, use those little bitty things as, as you know, the guard wipes his, wipes his face and his snot with his mouth with his hand as he reaches out to take the, the document from you. Little bitty things, man, that make your characters and subconsciously your players go, damn, am I going to get sick if, it, oh my God, these people are coughing on me. Am I, am I going to have to make a, a constitution save here and get sick pretty soon? That's the little tensions that you can use. That's the, the little techniques to, to, to add to the flavor, to add to the, to the atmosphere of what you're doing. Um, so yeah, you can go ahead and go along through, uh, get their, make their way back into Tovog. And basically, they have to end the ritual. Now, the first two parts have already happened, whether they like it or not. Uh, there's kind of a little thing, if you do it right slash wrong, where they could actually be the people that started the whole thing. Didn't want to lean into that. That's a lot of, of pins and levers to manipulate to put your party in that position. It is fun, and I'll save, you, save that for you as a DM to, to read about and decide if you want to do it. But yeah, there is, a, there is a path that's given to actually have your party be the ones that trigger the, the, um, the three-step process. 
So anyway, at this point, the first step's already happened. The, the sacrifice has been made by someone who has the blood of an outsider on their hands. The second thing has happened. The, the pyres of the, of the plague are burning, filling the sky with, yeah. So this, this magical plague that Vecna has released on Tovog has started killing everything. And then the third thing that you're looking at is the person completing the ritual must slay a king. Now, that's where the wordy gets a little bit weird, because the only king that's in this area to most people's minds are, is Koss. And you're not going to have access to Koss. You're not even able to kill Koss. You know, Vecna can't even kill Koss, if we're being honest. Otherwise, he'd be dead by now. <laughs> Actually, Vecna did kill Koss, but Koss killed Vecna. They killed each other in, in their first round of combat. There's never been a second round of combat, because, I mean, how badass can your badass be when his lieutenant can just chop up? Walk up to him, chop him half repeatedly. Just anyway, <laughs> anyway I digress. Um, so the trick here is that someone has to be the king. And that falls back to what they dealt with earlier in the madhouse. There are some dialogue options, some, some interactions that they had in, in that area that should have at least endeared them to some of the people there. And if you played it out right, the party actually encountered the king of the prophecy when they were first in Tovog. Um, the king being the self-appointed king of the asylum. And he says, I am king of the crazed. And everyone's like, yes, yes, yeah, sure, yeah, you are. Okay, buddy, let's go. So by the affirmation of the staff and of the other people in the madhouse saying, okay, cool, you're the king, just stop putting your fingers in my oatmeal. Um, okay, yeah, you're the king. Can I have my can I have my pencil back now? You know, he has been placed in the position of a king. So this person is now completely 100% uh, on for being the sacrifice. Didn't say king by blood, king by just a recognized king. So now your party's plunging back into the, into this madhouse that's been taken over by the cultists, just on the verge of of Vecna being released. Um, it's kind of one of those in the nick of time things. Now this also becomes a DM technique type of a thing, okay? If you're, um, you're, you need to impart urgency without penalizing them. And there's not just this module, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of adventures that kind of, that, that have you, that put you in that balance. And as a dungeon master, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to keep because you don't want to sit there and put a little freaking hourglass on your table and go, guys, once this runs out, the game's over and you screwed because that, you know, that's, that's going to lead to a panic. That's going to lead to a bad decision. You want to let your players explore the moment as their character. You want to let them think creatively. You want to give them the time to think outside the box. Um, hey, uh, I think I just had a beep in. I apologize. Thanks for the um, flip flop. appreciate you jumping in. Thanks for the follow. Uh, good to see you in my chat. Um, is talking D&D stuff here, going through Vecna Reborn, the second module. But hey, welcome to our stream and appreciate you being here. So we're just, um, anyway, going back to, to uh, I apologize, I got a little bit off off track there. Handling the the situation where your players are in, in a urgent, time-sensitive, um, hey, that's awesome, cool. Well, hi, Flip Flop, nice to have you here. Um, but anyway, so... Keeping the urgency going with your people is is a balancing act because you don't want to let them waste an entire session talking about plans when you know that you're supposed to end this. But you don't want to step on your party's creativity. You don't want to say, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. You can only do this and you have to do this right now. Then why are we playing? Then why are they actually playing? A, you're, you're, at that point, you're devolving into storytelling. Um. Let's be honest, as Dungeon Masters, we all know that there are a lot of binary situations. Of, uh, if the party doesn't do this, then this happens. If the party does do this, then this happens. So our job is to manage that binary situation and at the very least give the party the illusion that they're making a choice, that the choice isn't being forced upon them through gameplay mechanics. So a, a tension situation, a, a timeline situation, a lot of times we'll find ourselves in that and lacking the tools to force the timing to accelerate, we often put the timing, the quote-unquote, the, the timeline on hold. We don't even worry about the timeline because of the threat of pushing player agency to the side. 
that's something you're gonna have to find each person finds it themselves each adventure even requires a different level of it and each play group even handles it a little bit differently so just a little bit of a tip this is on a timeline but it's an artificial timeline it's something that you're putting on the characters make them feel like they have to hurry but at the same time mechanically if they screw around or if, if someone gets sick and has to miss and and you cut off the whatever it's not it's not an actual um what's the word i mean it's it's not punishment it's not something that oh you guys taking too long so this happens because otherwise the adventure ends and you failed now that leads us to another thing if your party has said screw off we're going over that hill over there we're not going near that city full of plague shit and five days later they're still trampling through the mists then they fail you got to be willing as a, as a dm to do that once in a while you know, if you put the conditions in front of them, they know they got six days to solve this, and they decide to go to Vegas for five of those six days, and they know it's going to take three days to get back to the campaign, they failed. Fail them. They made the decision. That's part of an engaging world. That's part of a world with consequences. That's not something you made them do. That's not something the adventure made them do. That's something that your party as a group of players decided to ignore the story and go do their thing. Blow the story up. That part of the kingdom gets tore up. But the plus side, you guys are having a good time in Vegas. What's next? You know, <laughs> just as a, as a bad example. But anyway, so when they get back over, the ritual is almost complete. And they have a few moments, literally moments, to, to stop the, the, the ritual from being completed, to stop Vecna from being reborn, okay? Uh, the first thing is Dost, to prevent the death of Dost, which is the king of fools that they met earlier. The second thing is to kill one of the, the Vokar, the main cultist. Another cultist has to finish it up. Destroy the knife. Obliterate the holy symbol or the unholy symbols. The runes are on the, on the floor around the, the ritual itself. Snuff out the candles. There's lots of candles that are lining it up. Depose the king. Make sure the king says he's no longer king anymore. So it gives the DM six, five or six different things that the party can do. To stop the ritual in addition to anything else that they could think of that might be creative enough to add into it as long as the party can pull off at least three of the six the ritual falls apart they win okay yay um if the party fails they lose do they lose though i don't know that's up to you um honestly they don't really lose because this is yet another reminder in in D, &D parlance that sometimes your heroes are not the hero they just they're nobodies they lose, uh, the woman starts screaming, rises up in the air, energy flows through her, black clouds of evil start wisping around, the body explodes, and Vecna floats down. Physically manifested, missing, still missing an eye and missing a hand. Fool can't keep his shit together for nothing. And that's it. The word has, he speaks, and is, is, the word he speaks is strange upon your ears. It's not an evil word, but rather one of power. Pure energy somehow vocalized. Once the word has been spoken, Marit's body lifts into the air and her entire form begins to swell. Dark light streams from her eyes, nose, her open mouth, and even her ears. Finally, the blackness consumes her utterly and then the entire room. When you can see again, standing in her place is a naked human male. His form is tall and gaunt. Your worst fears are confirmed as you notice that one of his eye sockets is hollow and empty and one of his arms in his, ends in a jagged stump. Vecna has been reborn. That's the fail. And guess what? Vecna's going to walk right on by them and start killing everyone in Tovag because he doesn't care about the players. The players are so minuscule on the radar at this point. All they can be aware of is, damn, we screwed up. What the actual true impact on that is, is up to you, okay, as a DM. Uh, if they succeed, typically on a success, you let your party out of a domain. Um, you let them get on with their normal life. If they want to stay, the, the book kind of goes in and gives the party some options for further adventures in Cavitas, further adventures in Tovog, and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. Hey, we're right at an hour. Good. Um, so, bottom line, Vecna Reborn, the second adventure of the Vecna, um, I hate to say trilogy, of the three modules named after Vecna. They are a trilogy, though, if you, if you sit down and read them. If you've sat down and got through all of them, they do actually form a trilogy, but it's not a playable campaign trilogy for the same characters. The characters in, in Vecna Lives are actually replacements for the Circle of Eight. They get killed at the very beginning of Vecna Lives. 
The characters in Vecna Reborn are a, simp a, a different group, a smaller group of characters, lower level and smaller, that get sucked into the Domains of Dread to deal with that. Die, Vecna, die. This is the second one. Die, Vecna, die. Honestly, as much shit as I talk about Vecna, as much crap as I give people for simping for Vecna, this is a good module. This is a good, fun adventure. This is actually damn near its own campaign. And what I like about it is it crosses it. This was, man... This was kind of the end of, of, in my opinion, this was kind of TSR's or Wizard's uh, embrasure of Planescape as a tying in point, even though it was towards the end of 2nd edition before 3rd edition came and threw everything in the crap again. This is a really cool uh, adventure. We're going to, I'm not going to go too far into that one right now. It is the third part. How do they work as, this, as, a, as a trilogy? WGA for Vecna Lives, the first lore mention of Vecna, the first interaction anyone has had in the game world with Vecna other than the stories of his hand in his arm, or his hand in his eye. Uh, Vecna takes over Halmadar, who finds the eye in the hand, and, and as we know, if you continually roll, eventually there's a chance that Vecna can take your body over. That happens to Halmadar at the start of this module. So Vecna is going through all this trouble to become, to finish his, his reformation. The party gets killed as a circle of eight, starts over as their new characters, and spends the entire time chasing Halmadar over to Tovag Rog just to get into a fight with him there and, and end it. This is a 10th level. Um, this, yeah, this is a, in short, designed to kill your characters. Don't let your characters bring their favorite people because you're supposed to kill them, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Um, six to eight player characters of 12 to 15 level. Okay, that's high level back in the day. That's high level in 5th edition. So the, the first module is a very high level adventure. Horribly structured, excellent lore, great story, piss poor gameplay. Second adventure, light on the lore, light on the exposition, other than just knowing that something's going on between Vecna and Koss. Very good module, very good writing. Very well, very good atmosphere. Fun adventure on its own, but people that are playing it are going to invariably be disappointed because they don't get to, to, to deal with Vecna or Koss or any of that. It's Vecna reborn as in, he's way up here doing all of this high-level Vecna shit while they're down here in the weeds trying to keep it from happening. They'd never cross paths um, other than just the title and the locations are the only thing about it, okay? Number three, so the first one has Vecna being killed or dispatched. When De Vecna reforms, he is actually in Ravenloft. He's in his Domain of Dread here. So the second module, Vecna Reborn, is part of a trilogy. It follows in sequence. Die, Vecna, die, one way or another, picks up where this original one leaves off. Um, the number one thing is this actually brings in Vecna, the serpent, speaks, uh, uh, has Vecna, has Ayas and has my girl Lady of Pain, uh, the Lady of Pain in Sigil, and and all kinds of cool interaction. It does a lot of of world jumping. It does a lot of trans uh, of transcontinental movement, but it actually provides the resources for the party to be able to do it. Unlike uh, Vecna lives, man. I mean, your party's supposed to spend two weeks in the library, great. The library of the city of Greyhawk, 13 different temples that they have to go check. And the damn module don't even give you a map of the town. So the assumption is you have all of the content already. You don't need the, you know, we're just going to give you a, a crappy story and expect that you know the city upside down. So, but again, I digress. When this stuff was written, the assumption was you would not buy this adventure if you didn't already have this other stuff. So, you know, things differ between old content and new content to a certain a certain extent, so Vecna lives and eh. Vecna reborn. Cool, 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 cool atmosphere, cool adventure, very dialogue heavy. Die, Vecna, die. This is going to probably be its own two hour, uh, <laughs> two hour module review preview. Um, I'm actually incorporating this into our Sigil of Fate campaign. I'm running a fifth edition. Getting, hopefully, getting everyone jazzed up for Planescape. Uh, we're recording it, putting over on the YouTube channel when when I don't have technical issues unfortunately 
But man, as a structure, even though I, I I'm not a Vecna fan, I laugh at people that simp for Vecna. This is a cool module. It's a cool story. It's a cool way to tie things together. So a lot of that I take back. You might see some other tabs up here. Um, and I was kind of doing some double checking and triple checking on my own work, uh, or not my own work, on documentation to see when the hell did Vecna actually pop up? Because if you read the, if you, if all you do is you go and you push, type into Google, when did Vecna d d it's going to tell you that he was named as a demigod in 3.5. And that is true. In 3.5, he was named as a demigod. Actually, uh, this module here takes place around that time point. This was the end of second leading into third edition, so it acknowledges. If anything, this is the module that plays through uh, the adventure that plays through Vecna's ascension to a lesser power. Now, people are like, oh, he's got... Okay, in Planescape terms, you have lesser power, uh, in intermediate power, and greater power. Uh, lesser power. Vecna has the, the, the strength of St. Cuthbert. Vecna is a little bit weaker than Ball, Miracle, or Bane. Um, Vecna on the power scale he may be the most powerful wizard to ever had once had lived. He might be the most powerful lich that's ever lived, but he is still way down there. Thauri's Dune is the ultimate evil of entropy. He's existed through, they have existed through every edition of D&D. &D. Every setting of D&D &D acknowledges Thara's Dune. Um, there are certain deities that don't exist outside of other settings. Um, Thar's Dune is one of those guys that transcends every damn setting, every damn edition. That's your big, bad, evil god, for lack of a better term. Your ultimate darkness of power, whatever you want to call it. Entropus, this gigantic thing that floats the afterbirth of creation uh, that, was, that was talked about in the Elder Evils book uh, 3.5, you know. All kinds of crazy shit out there. So so keep that in mind that, that you know, when you start getting into Vecna, I'm going to be interested to see how they do it, how they tie him in, how much of it's going to rely on domains of dread transporting people back and forth. But apparently Vecna is supposed to be in the next year's, in the next five-year product cycle, he is going to be the center point of Wizards' production cycle. Everything will be produced in, in accordance with a overarching storyline where Vecna's going to be administering this scheme to take over the multiverse using some of the biggest, baddest out of history. So we'll see how it works out. You know, at the end of the day, if it's an opportunity for us to get more classic content and to get some lore put into the world that's not there right now, I'm all for it, man. You know, uh, the Realm of Terror. This was your, I don't, you guys are looking at this cheesy ass picture of, of, of Dracula. Man, this was the shiz back in the day, back in, uh, was it 90, 89, 90? Uh, basically, your Domains of Dread, which we recognize now through the Van Richten's book, this is where they formed. This is where they were canonized. Uh, and this is where we're playing around in Vecna Reborn. Domains of Dread make a big difference. Uh, I will rewind a bit. The Vecna Reborn module did a good job of, of giving... The dungeon master enough information about those particular domains to to uh, really give you the atmosphere to give you the tools to build the atmosphere um, barring that you may need to either get into your uh, van Richten's guide if you're a fifth layer if you're a fifth level fifth edition person if you like the older content pick up the Ravenloft uh, box set the domains of dread is you'll see another one that says domains of dreads 2e Basically, what they did was they took Realms of Terror, Islands of Terror, and revised them and put them in Domains of Dread. There are th two different Ravenloft box sets for the same edition. Uh, if you're a collector, collect them all. It's Pokemon style, who cares between them? If you are just trying to get the best information for your best bang for your buck, don't buy the Domains of Dread. Get the Realms of Terror and the Islands of Terror. You're going to get way more content that way. It's like uh, domains of Realms of Terror and Island of Terror give you, oh gosh, what? 40-ish? 40, 45 domains. Uh, Realm of Terror and the Island of Terror. Domains cuts it back down to like 26. Gets rid of a few of them. Combines a couple of them. And, you know, I'm just... I'm against the idea of anything cutting information. Let me decide if I want to use that stuff or not. 
Don't take a revision and say, well, there's 52 domains and 30 and, and 11 of them are redundant. That's not your job to do. That's my job. Give me the content. Let me make the decision. So I'm always going to default to whatever gave me more content, even if it wasn't the best content, even if it wasn't the best, it wasn't well written, even if for its time it was politically incorrect. I want the content so I can turn it into what I want. Do yourself the favor. Go back a couple levels. When you're looking at something, go back a source or two. Is there more behind that? Sometimes you get to the, the original source and it sucks. You're like, oh God, board, Keep on the Borderlands is a horrible, horrible module. I'm glad I, they did return to the Keep on the Borderlands. That's not a good, that's a bad, uh, Keep is kind of a cool module. Point being, give yourself as a dungeon master the opportunity to go as far back in the content as you can to gather the most information you can to make it your own. You know, so, so yeah. It's, it's just my little scree, if you will. If the information is available, don't deny yourself access to the information. Don't go, well, 5th edition says it's because of this. Well, okay. 5th edition managed to take Spelljammer, which, although I wasn't a fan of, of it, was a really cool, really cool system. Took uh, three box sets, four splat books, and, well, I'm talking shit. Let me actually go look. Spelljammer Classic. And this isn't all of it. This is... Uh... Parcel, Gray Space, Spelljammer. Uh, yeah, you're looking at probably, um, I've got nine books here, and two of those are box, three of those are box sets. So three box sets and six books in my collection, okay? 700-ish pages of content. And Wizards turned that into a 140-page piece of crap book that gave you just enough to get frustrated. So a lot of people like, Spelljammer sucks. I don't like Spelljammer because I don't like spaceships and lasers in my D&D. That's just me. But the original setting was good. The original rules were good. They gave you the science to go with it. They gave you the lore to back up the science. Um, they gave you good ship-to-ship -ship combat. They gave you travel rules. They gave you everything to make the system work that 5th edition did not give you. So before, if you picked up Spelljammer, you're like, this game sucks, blah, 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 blah. Go pick up the content. Go pick up the original first edition, second edition content in, in, uh, and, and take the two put together. Uh, fifth edition, take the first edition stuff, look at it through a fifth edition lens, and all of a sudden Spelljammer is a hell of a cool setting. Like, damn, why would anyone else play other, anywhere else? You know, so taking fifth edition as written, taking it for the gospel, and taking it as the only thing that exists is doing yourself and your group a huge disservice. Dude, I like 4th edition content, personally. Um, you know, my uh, Planescape is a, a, is a big passion of mine. I love the Planescape universe. Uh, again, we're running a Sigils of Fate, which is a, a live play campaign set in, in Planescape. But I will tell people, if you're trying to learn about the Outer Planes, pick up the 4th edition Manual of the Planes. A very well written, very well written book. An entertaining read and an informative book. Somehow it managed to, to take... The vast majority of four editions worth of extra planar lore put into one book that was consistent across four editions and was still informative. Um, so, man, don't worry about the, the the negatives as far as, oh, that's first edition, I'm fifth edition. Oh, that's third edition, I'm fifth edition. Content is content. The more content you have, the more stuff you have to work with, the more you can flesh out to worlds, the more immersive your games become. So, yeah, don't, don't be a, an edition snob when it comes to content, okay? You're, you're, you're just hurting yourself. You're hurting your your party. You're, you're, you're limiting your options. And the stuff is cheap, y'all. It's two bucks, three bucks for a PDF, man. But, um, okay, I'm sitting here at about an hour and 10 minutes. Typically, my YouTube videos, most people won't look at them when they get this long. So I am gonna go ahead and pause my recording on YouTube here. If you've been joining me on the YouTube video, thank you so much. I appreciate your time, appreciate your your, your views. If you enjoyed this video, like, follow, subscribe. Follow me over on Twitch as well. Etsy, Patreon, Facebook, it's all under DM Geezer Jim. If you found me on this, the one search, you can find me on all the other search. Love to have your support on Patreon. Uh, if you want to help me continue being able to have the, uh, to invest in these these projects, to, to doing my mapping tutorials, and, and just, you know, love to have some support on Patreon. Just need a map or two, want to throw a brother or a dollar, head over to my Etsy site. I've got 30 or 40 map packs on there that you can uh, pick up and have some fun with. Uh, if all you're doing is watching, you know what? That's huge, hugely valuable too. You are giving me your time. 
and thank you for sharing that time with me. But uh, YouTube crowd, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here. Twitch crowd, I'm going to take a pause for a second, get up, move around. Um, probably come back and, and bullcrap a little bit longer. But uh, hey, thanks for being with me so far.